Okay, so good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation of Let's Clear the Air. This presentation is going to be recorded for, for, for future use. Um, I would like to introduce tonight's committee for, for the presentation. My name is Jill Harper and I will be serving as the host for the evening. Tina Murdy will be introducing our speakers. Sydney Fath will be monitoring audience questions in the chat. Nate Hover is providing the IT support for tonight. The presentation is being brought to you in collaboration with Finger Lakes Community Schools, the Wayne Wellness Group, and the Council of Alcoholism and Addictions of the Finger Lakes. We realize that there are many young people that are struggling to find answers to their questions about vaping and some who may be willing to quit given the appropriate information and resources. We have planned this event to be three days before the American Cancer Society's Great American Smokeout on November 17th. It is our hope that in providing this panel discussion, we may enhance audience motivation and capacity to reduce youth vaping in Wayne County. We have invited a variety of local experts to speak on the topic of vaping, each with a different perspective, who will provide facts and answers to your questions. Following each speaker's presentation, there will be a time for audience members to ask any questions by entering them into the chat box. You then will receive live answers from our panel. We would like to remind you to please put your speakers on mute. Tina will now introduce our first speaker for the night. All right, everybody. Our very first speaker is Mary Beth Dreyer. She comes to us from the Upstate New York Poison Center, which is a free telephone triage center that's available 24-7, 365. It covers 54 counties in upstate New York and is staffed by highly skilled individuals who are trained in toxicology. Mary Beth is here today to discuss what's in a vape and introduce a video which demonstrates the difference between the perception and the reality of vaping. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me. I know this panel, um, this committee has put together quite a panel of experts from, from New York State and, and beyond, perhaps, um, to bring really exciting information, current information about the topic of vaping. Um, like she said, I am Mary Beth Dreyer from the Upstate New York Poison Center. I'm one of uh, now two public health educators that is uh, tasked with covering the 54 counties of upstate New York on all things poison. So really, um, my job is to hopefully prevent poisonings from happening and to promote the use of uh, the call center itself. So I'm assuming most, if not all of us have cell phones. I would uh, encourage you to take two seconds to program that 800 number into your cell phone. It is the um, the phone number that you can use wherever you are in the U.S. Uh, should you have a poison emergency or need help or information about anything poison, we do um, offer our services 24-7, 365. We're always open. We are completely free. All of our resources are free and our expert uh, telephone triage information is free as well. So we do take the majority of our calls do come from the public. We do get a fair amount of calls from healthcare uh, facilities, either the hospital ERs um, or the uh, urgent care centers are we're noticing uptick in um, calls from uh, clinical providers from those sites as well. That seems to be you know where people are going if they have poison um, poison emergencies in their house. So most of our calls come from uh, younger children um, or parents of younger children, I should say, um, that happen in their households. And we hope to and um, try to do our best to help manage those uh, cases at home to prevent people from going to urgent care centers or hospital ERs. Um, so that's just a little blurb about what it is that the Upstate Poison Center does. Um, and we do cover all things poisoning and um, one of which and um, is why I'm here tonight is to cover the topic of vaping. Uh, one thing uh, before I move on to the video that um, I wanted to share tonight was to just tell you a little bit about our website, give a little push to, to encourage people to visit that website, 
to get materials. Um, if you are um, you know, a parent who is interested in some information about current topics that might be trending, um, or if you're an agency that wanted materials to distribute at events um, to share with your audience, you can, uh, you can head there to, uh, to get materials sent directly to your home or to your office. Also, you'll find uh, previous webinars that we, we hold that are targeted towards uh, public health educators, but also relevant to parents and community members as well. You can sign up for our newsletter and just be um, as current as possible on, on uh, the topic of poison and poison prevention. We also have social media, which um, you can um, go searching out as well if you're interested. And another thing that we have on our website, which is um, I'm getting to the point here. I know I'm trying to crunch for time because I know you guys have a lot of information um, that is ahead of you tonight. Uh, we do have a number of educational videos that have been developed for the general public. Um, on the topic of um, carbon monoxide and plant poisoning, safe holiday celebrations, um, medicinal and uh, edible cannabis, and, and vaping. So everyone's probably like, come on, get to the point, lady. So this video was created by some of our toxicologists and public health education staff. Um, it's geared towards students. We also have one that's geared towards parents, but this one uh, was geared towards students and it discusses the, the dangers of vaping and also demonstrates how many um, differences there are between the perception and the reality of vaping and really what is in a vape and how dangerous uh, vaping can be. So we can go ahead and start that video up. to nicotine yeah. but <laughs> I, I could tell but yeah. if I wanted to quit vaping I guess I could but I, I really don't want to give up no? like, yeah why, why not <laughs> I mean there's, there's no reason to give up though vaping is dangerous because it's the same as smoking and that there's nicotine in most, uh, if not all, of the vape products, but it gives you the perception, because it's not cigarettes, that it might be a little bit safer. I'm Willie Eggleston. I'm a toxicologist at the Upstate New York Poison Center. One jewel pod is about one pack of cigarettes. We really need to get the message out to our kids that these are not safe products. In Health Watch, the Food and Drug Administration is investigating a potential link between seizures and the use of e-cigarettes. According to the FDA, users in some of those cases also reported experiencing fainting or tremors. A new study coming out of Yale University, it finds that people who use some e-cigarettes are consuming more than the ingredients that are listed on that package. Like, do you aware that there are dangerous chemicals in it? Yeah. I mean, I do, I do, but the actual component of the juice that we are vaping is, is PG and VG and nicotine, so... Actually, if you if you think about the ingredients, like the safety of the ingredients, it's it's really not that dangerous, I think. It tastes tastes better. One in five high school students now reports vaping, and one in twenty middle school students is reported vaping. There's harmful chemicals, there's nicotine, they're addictive, and they can impact brain development. The new jewel devices and other similar products look like USB sticks, so the kind of thing you would stick into your computer to save a paper or save a file on, but these small USB shaped ones are pretty small and easy to hide. Nicotine to your brain, reprogramming you to crave more and more. Don't get hacked. I 
Is it expensive? Uh, uh, not really. Five uh, bucks. It's a lot healthier than just smoking cigarettes. The reality is, is they can be just as dangerous. In addition to the harmful chemicals that are in the vaping product, there are also tiny particles, and those tiny particles can lodge themselves in your lungs. And when they do that, uh, over time, they may cause damage. We still don't know because they are such new products. Some people think that vaping is no big deal, but that is just an illusion. Do you vape? Yeah. You do? Do you have a vape with you today? Yeah. I see. Oh, okay. Cool, I want to hold your hand up for me. I'm gonna take the vape like this, I'm gonna put it into your hand, like that. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do, okay? Okay, here we go, watch very carefully. Boom. <laughs> Did you know that if you vape, you're more likely to start smoking cigarettes? It's not magic, it's statistics. Yeah, yeah I don't wanna do that. And so at the end of the day, is vaping safe? Only for someone who's currently smoking. If you're not currently smoking, vaping is not a safe thing to start. I really don't want them to smoke at all, like start smoking at all. Okay, so before I move forward, I know um, we've been given comments on that video before about the one comment that Dr. Eggleston, Eggleston said that vaping is only safe for people who currently smoke. Um, so he's been getting a lot of pushback about that comment and um, just, and some people in the audience might already know this, but for those that, that don't, that vaping was encouraged for people who are trying to stop smoking. So I think that's what he was alluding to. So uh, before questions might arise about that, that it's not, it's not safe for anybody before it was um, people who were trying to quit and having a difficult time quitting cigarette smoking, vaping was um, originally um, encouraged is one way that people might be able to reduce their cigarette use. So, so that's a little bit of a um, um, background on what is in a vape. So I know the next slide has a quick, and I'm, I know that I'm kind of running toward on time, but the next slide that I have did show some of what is in a vape. Um, so I can talk real quick about some of these things. I could talk a lot longer on this, but I know that there's other people that will be talking about these things as well. So there are a number of things, including nicotine, um, which is a chemical that is highly addictive, especially for those who are the adolescents, the adolescent uh, population whose brains are still developing um, and forming, and they have these receptors that end up having them be more and more um, receptive to addiction. And it was also noted in the video that those who vape are more than likely to try cigarette smoking and perhaps other substance abuse uh, or substances in the future as well. So two important uh, pieces of information there. There's also thousands of chemicals that can be found in a vape, highly toxic, that can lead to Evaldi, which is the vaping-related lung um, and I know that there's somebody that on, on the panel tonight that will be talking about the health effects. I'm assuming that's going to that's gonna be touched on as well. So that is a really quick um, vaping 101 that I wanted to share. And I was happy to, to be included in this panel. I'm going to stick around for the rest of the evening. If people have questions, I'd be happy to try and to answer those questions. And anything that the Poison Center can do for you or your organization, we're certainly here as a resource, um, you know, from tonight and beyond. So thanks, thanks for having me. That this is uh, an important topic that you know Wayne County is is really at the forefront of getting information into the public's hands. And I can tell you, you know, I sit on a number of committees throughout the state, and um, you know, it's 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 something that all communities are facing. And the numbers of those, especially in middle school, that are starting to to experiment with vaping is on, on the up and up, which I know, um, you know, somebody here is also going to talk about data and statistics. So I'm sure that that's something that they'll touch on as, as well. So thanks again for having me. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for being here and for sharing all that important information. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick note to our audience, if you have any questions for Mary Beth or any of our speakers as we continue on, just go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, Mary Beth, I think you did such a fantastic job. I do not see any questions, but maybe those will pop up. And if they do, I'll be sure to send them your way. Okay, so the next panelist is me, Tina Marty. Let's go back. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Tina Murphy. I am a New York State Public Health Corps fellow, and I work with Wayne County Community Schools. I'm here to present on vaping trends. So I'm going to do a quick snapshot of national statistics, and then I'm going to really get into the local data. And the local Wayne County data was very kindly prepared for us by Rob Lillis of Evalumetrics. So I want to give him a shout out. We couldn't make it tonight, but I am going to try my best to be as complete and accurate as he would be. So the first point I do want to make is that millions of adults use e-cigarettes. Millions. So vaping is not just a young person issue, and there is no evidence that it's safe for anyone, including adults, just as Mary Beth Dreyer shared with us. So why do we focus so much on youth vaping? Well, one reason is that for adults, traditional cigarettes are still the most commonly used tobacco product. And for adults who vape, many, if not most, also smoke combustible cigarettes as well. But for young people, these cigarettes are by far the most commonly used tobacco product. So how common is vaping in youth across the US? Well, this is some 2022 data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey, and we can see that over 3% of middle school students and more than 14% of high school students reported currently using e-cigarettes in 2022. That's about 2.5 million young people estimated to be vaping regularly. And when they asked sophomores in high school um, how easy it was to get vapes, Two thirds of them reported that it was fairly easy or very easy to obtain vapes. Youth predominantly reported using disposable products, so that's about 55%. And they overwhelmingly reported using flavored vapes. Almost 85% reported using flavored vapes. For youth who said that they vaped, more than 40% used frequently, meaning more than 20 days in the past month and more than a quarter used every single day. So importantly, most teens who use any tobacco product reported wanting to quit. Almost two thirds had seriously considered quitting and over 60% quit for at least a day in the past year. So now what's happening locally? So in 2021, we saw that 4.7% of sixth graders and that works out to be about one out of every 21 sixth graders. And then it's one out of every 13, approximately eighth graders, about one out of every seven 10th graders, and more than one in five 12th graders reported vaping in the past 30 days right here in Wayne County. And it's very, very similar to what's happening nationally as well. So when we look at trends, there was an increase in reported use among local youth from 2017 to 2019. And then there was a decline in 2021 for most populations. However, rates of vaping were still higher in 2021 than they were in 2017. So now what we're looking at here is perceptions, not behaviors. This is the percent of local youth, so Wayne County youth, who did not perceive harm from vaping. And we can see that those lines are trending down, meaning less and less students are seeing vaping as harmless. Yet there's still somewhere around 25% of young people who don't think of vapes as harmful. So why do we care about perceived harm? Well, high school students in Wayne County who did not perceive harm from vaping were three and a half times more likely to report that they used e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. And finally, the Evalumetrics Youth Survey, the EYS, which is where all the local data came from, is something that we're super lucky to have as a community. 
And it's not just vaping specific data, but for information on many risk and protective factors that kind of help tell the story of what it's like to be a young person in Wayne County. And you can find summative reports for each year at this website. If you go to waynepartnership.org, you can find it there. And the next EYS is going to be conducted in a few months. So we're gonna find out, are more local youth or less local youth vaping? Will more youth perceive vaping as a health harming behavior? And really, I think those are the things that this panel and this audience might be able to actually make a difference in. Are there any questions? Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that very powerful data, Tina. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat, but that doesn't mean any are or that there's not any on their way. Um, so if we see any, I will definitely let you know. All right. Sounds good. Um, we will let's move on to our next presenter. We have our next presenter is Shane Dean. He's the principal at Marion Junior Senior High. Prior to this current role, he served as a pre-K through 12 assistant principal at Marion. He started his career in education at Phelps Clifton Springs Central School District, teaching grades five and six and coaching multiple sports for several years. He's here to speak on what issues Marion has faced in terms of vaping, what's been done to alleviate the issues and what are other ongoing issues. Thanks, Tina. Thanks everybody for having me here and thanks for being here. I think this is a, a huge step in the right direction to all of those of you who are out there listening. It's uh, just being here is, is a great um, community response to what we're seeing as kind of a pandemic among our youth. All right, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So this evening, I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, kind of our journey through vaping here at Marion Junior Senior High School and uh, what we're doing right now to try to help our students uh, with this challenging issue. Um, so I started here in January of 2018 as the assistant principal, as Tina just mentioned, and um, I, I didn't know a whole lot about vaping. As she said, I was a teacher and a coach prior, and I was a little bit familiar with it, but had no idea what um, what a profound impact it was having on our youth. And so kind of caught me off guard as assistant principal who uh, would respond to most of the vaping problems. Uh, we had a ton of infractions in that, in that second semester of 2018. And uh, what we saw that was that our students really weren't crafty yet. They didn't really know how to hide. They didn't know that they were supposed to hide. They didn't know how much trouble they would get in. Um, and at that time, our response was a, a, a little bit extreme on the punitive side. We were suspending students out of school for five days for their first offense. And if they had a second or third offense, it was uh, they were going to a superintendent's contract, at least in our opinion, in my opinion that was too punitive. So uh, we, we quickly saw that we were suspending way too many students and that it wasn't fixing the problem. In fact, many of them were just going home on suspension and vaping at home because no parents were home. So uh, we started what we call the vape playlist. And uh, that was a series of tasks that students needed to complete when they were caught vaping. And if they agreed to complete those learning tasks about vaping and the harmful effects, then their consequence would be reduced from five days of in-school suspension to three days of in-school suspension. Um, students almost universally agreed to do that. I, I wouldn't say that it had a, a huge impact on the rate of vaping, um, but at least our students weren't going home to vape for five days straight. Uh, so we felt good about that. The following school year in 2018-19, we continued that vape playlist and um, Again, students were, were cooperative and willing to complete that playlist um, and often said that they felt they, they learned something new or several new things during that playlist, but, but we didn't see a significant change. Uh, so in the following summer of 2019, our health teacher was willing to go get trained on a program called Not on Tobacco, short, short called Not. And 
Uh, having our health teacher trained in that, the following school year, any students caught vaping were given the option of the traditional consequence, which was five days of in-school suspension at that time, or participating in the NOT program with the health teacher. And I think what was a little bit unique to Marion was if the students agreed to participate in that 10 uh, meeting program of not, they didn't have any punitive consequences. Uh, we felt like having them do that program, taking time out of their schedule, often after school, uh, and having 10 meetings with our health teacher to complete this not program would be more impactful than putting them in in-school suspension. Um, what we see a lot in students that are vaping at school is that they're avoiding classes and they're avoiding schoolwork. And so these are the students that are often in the bathroom for extended periods of time. And um, we're often looking for them throughout the school day because they don't want to be in class and they prefer to be as, as gross as it sounds, sitting in a bathroom stall and, and using their vape, usually looking at their phone and using their vape. Uh, so putting them in in-school suspension didn't make a ton of sense either, because again, we're fulfilling the behavior. We're, we're pulling them out of class. They're avoiding the schoolwork. They may have to do schoolwork in an ISS, but they don't have to sit through their classes. So the NOT program was successful. Many, many students uh, chose that route. And many students were saying to us that they wanted to quit. Uh, we didn't have a lot of students like those young men in the video uh, that said, you know, vaping isn't harmful. I, I think vaping is fine. Uh, mo most of our students were saying, yeah, I know it's harmful and I want to quit, but it's hard for me to quit. And I've kind of learned this behavior as a work avoidance. Um, following that, well, during that school year, as everybody well knows, uh, we had a little thing called COVID show up. And so unfortunately, all of our students went home for three months. Um, and had some remote education, but varying amounts. And uh, in my opinion, it was interesting to see that youth value metrics data because in my opinion, at least here at Marion, uh, that made vaping rates increase because you had students at home who had opportunity, uh, whether their parents were home or not during the COVID pandemic, pandemic shutdown, uh, who had a great opportunity to spend a lot of time by themselves, maybe in their bedroom and, and probably vaping if they were already addicted. Um, in the following school year here at Marion, we ran a, a hybrid school program that was half day every day for students. Some schools ran three on, two off. Either way, either way you cut it, it was a lot more time at home for kids. And usually uh, that following school year, that time at home was home alone. Their parents, in most cases, were at work. Again, great opportunity for kids to become more addicted to nicotine and vaping. Uh, so the following school year, in 2021-22, last year, we saw a significant increase in infractions at school, unfortunately. Um, it was stressful for kids. So we saw a significant increase in 21-22 uh, when we returned to full-day school for all students. And... Uh, we knew that we needed to help our students with this. It was stressful for them coming back to school full day uh, and their way to avoid the work and to kind of kind of escape from the problems of school and the problems of academics was, were to go to the bathroom and vape. And um, so we started working with our Wayne County Public Health educators um, and they have been fantastic. And that's really been very reactive whenever a student is caught vaping we contact Wayne County Public Health and we ask if they're willing to come out and meet with our students and um, they do that and nine times out of ten our students and their families are willing to do that as well so um, we have not seen many if any repeat offenders since doing that Wayne County Public Health education program students do, do still get punitive consequences but very few uh, if they're willing to do that Wayne County Public Health education, then they get some after school detentions. And uh, one new thing here is a Saturday detention, uh, but they don't miss any classes, which we think is, is kind of paramount in our response to vaping. Because like I said, a lot of times those students are trying to avoid classes anyway. Um, this year, the Wayne County Public Health, in fact, Lizzie, who I think is on this evening, has been 
delivering in depth for us, doing a great job. Um, the students meet with her often after school, complete that in-depth program. Uh, they get a certificate to show that they completed that and uh, hopefully increase their awareness and, and reduce their use. So I, I thought some important things because I've worked with a lot of parents and families and guardians uh, through this vaping process, unfortunately. Um, so from a school perspective, what, what we see is that students usually start vaping due to social influences. So keep a close eye on those friends groups. And, um, talk openly with va about vaping and harmful effects with your students. I would, I would absolutely recommend not being afraid to talk about it. Um, I would, as a parent, recommend experiencing the hidden in plain sight display. Um, the folks running this meeting can, can hook you up with that, and it is uh, really amazing to see all the creative ways and the business models that have taken shape um, in order to hide vapes. And so awareness there is key as a parent or guardian. And uh, watch out for unusual behavior. I, you know, often when I speak with a parent and say, you know, unfortunately, so-and-so was caught with a vape here at school today, they say, well, yeah, I've noticed that uh, they're spending more time in their bathroom, in the bathroom or in their bedroom, or it's weird. They just keep going for walks down the road by themselves. And if you're noticing changes in behavior like that, it's definitely something to keep a close eye on and, and maybe have a conversation with your young person about why they're doing that. Finally, um, if you do find out that your, your uh, child is vaping, first step is, in my opinion, is inform the school, coaches, advisors, other important adults. They may be part of uh, church or activities outside of school because it's going to take a uniform front in order to help that young person break that behavior and, and potential addiction. Uh, don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed to tell the school about it because I think Sometimes I talk to, to parents that already knew their young person was vaping. And as a school, that's hard because if I'd have known about it ahead of time, if we'd have known about it ahead of time, we could have worked together to come up with a plan and a remedy to, to help that young person. But when we find out about it because they get caught here at school, then, then we have to react in our school procedures. Um, try to be calm. I can assure you that as a parent, if I find out my young person was vaping, I, I would struggle with this one. But that's my advice. And as Ted Lasso says, be curious, not judgmental. Try to understand their perspective and, and why they might be vaping. Um, try to develop a plan. Pressure won't make them quit. And, and use the great school and community resources that you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, kids are very, very good at hiding vapes these days. You won't find everything, even if you search them daily and you search their bag and you search their bedroom. You won't find it all. So accept that. Uh, they know how to hide them here at school. I can assure you they know how to hide them at home as well. So be okay with that. And, and again, try to take that more partnership approach with your young person rather than uh, I'm going to search you every day because I fear if you, if you take that approach, they'll find a way around it. And uh, know that there's a difference between rebellious teenage behavior and addiction. And um, a lot of what we're seeing is addiction, unfortunately. And I would approach that differently than a rebellious teenage behavior. I could talk about this for hours, but I think I've already surpassed my time. So uh, do you have any questions or comments for me? Thank you, Shane. There was one question in the chat. I think someone just making sure they heard you correctly. They said, did Shane say that after the in-depth program, there were no repeat offenders? Well, yeah, um, Lizzie's great. <laughs> and, and we've been doing that program just for this school year. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm really impressed with the in-depth program and, and Lizzie's delivery. So that's true so far, knock on wood. That's awesome. Very impressive. Um, feel free to throw any more questions that you may have for Shane in the chat um, while people might be doing that. Shane, I just want to say thank you again for being here. I think there's a lot of school people on the call, and I know that this is a huge thing that schools are struggling with. So um, to hear your perspective today was uh, very valuable. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Godford Ensuite. Dr. Ansui is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health and Health Education at SUNY Brockport and one of my personal favorite professors. 
He has research interests in cancer survivorship, substance use, and health-related quality of life. He studies modifiable health-related behaviors, including combustible cigarette smoking, vaping, and physical activity, as well as psychosocial factors that contribute to disparities in cancer survivorship. Dr. Antwi is here to share with us information about what data is telling us about the health effects of vaping. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Tina, for uh, that kind of I mean, introduction. As Tina said, I'm a STEM professor at SUNY Brockport, uh, and my research basically focuses on vaping and uh, traditional, I mean, smoking as well as cancer survivorship. And today, I will talk to you about the health effects of uh, vaping. So this is how my uh, presentation will go. I will try to give a brief history about I mean vaping product. Then I will talk about the health effect, I will try to focus on vaping and respiratory diseases, vaping and cardiovascular diseases. Then I'll talk about vaping and cancer, as well as vaping and mental health. Then uh, unique impact on adolescent health, as well as other concerns. So to start with a, a brief historical context, I mean, as early as an in the early 1990s, when the negative effect of traditional smoking was kind of mounting, people uh, began to find alternative product as to help reduce the negative impact of smoking. But it was not until about 20 years ago, I mean, 2003 in China, where Chinese pharmacy came up or developed what we know as the vaping product or yeast grit. Uh, Dex first in the motivation behind I mean, creating or inventing Dex was, as I mean, one presenter said, was to market it or promote it as a safer option to uh, traditional smoking. I mean, he developed it because his father died of lung cancer uh, and the father was a smoker. So he was thinking about finding an alternative product to uh, the conventional smoking. So he came up with or developed uh, e cigarettes in 203. Then in 2017, I mean, 207, it um, entered the international market, including the US. Now, most of these companies do promote it as a safer option and a healthy option to uh, conventional smoking. But that's what I hope, I hope to help you kind of make a decision as to whether it is safe, as to whether it's healthy or not. I think by the end of my presentation, I will leave you to make that decision or that draw that conclusion yourself. And before I go into the heavy fat, let me say there is controversy or kind of misviews surrounding the safety and uh, the efficacy of vaping. Some have argued that vaping is kind of good or is an effective uh, cessation aid for those who do smoke. Uh, and others have also pointed out that, I mean, vaping is not an effective cessation aid. Actually, there are studies that have pointed that those who smoke and use vaping as cessation aid and are kind of using both at the same time, what we call dual use of uh, traditional um, smoking as well as uh, electronic cigarette. So with the effect of vaping on the lungs, I mean, harmful chemicals has been found in electronic cigarettes that um, can damage or can interfere with lung function. Example of some of these chemicals include what we call diacetyl, vitamin E acetate, and formidehyde as well as acronin. I mean, these chemicals do impair or do interfere with lung function. Now, vaping, as I said, contain these chemicals. And what these chemicals does is to cause inflammation in the lungs, and they do also cause what we call I mean, airway resistance. So how this happens is when someone I mean, vapes, it thus reduces or increase the amount, sorry, that's increase the amount of uh, pressure that is required to pump or to kind of aid the movement of airflow in the airways of the lungs. And that results in uh, lung impairment or lung uh, damage. Then also we have um, studies that have pointed that, I mean, those who vape, this study was actually done in the US where they were trying to assess the impact of vaping 
on bronchitis among high school students. And what they find was that those among those who vape, they were more likely to report symptoms of um, bronchitis, including chest discomfort and also, I mean, general fatigue, as well as people experiencing uh, shortness of breath. Then uh, there's also studies that point to the fact that people who vape are likely to develop what we call uh, vaping-related lipid pneumonia. I mean, this uh, results from kind of the oil substance in vape. Once someone vapes and inhales those oil substance, it causes inflammatory, and that can uh, result in hyperinflated lungs, which makes breathing I mean, difficult. And there is a case in North Carolina as well as a case in uh, Canada where young people who vape kind of develop uh, this outcome. Then also a study that I did with another colleague here, we found out that people who vape were more likely to report COPD, right? So here we compare people who were non-asthmatic, people who have never smoked and but were using uh, va or were vaping. And we tried to assess whether there was an association between vaping and COPD. So we compared those who do not vape uh, to those who vape. And what we found out was that those who vape were about three times more likely to uh, report um, COPD compared to those who do not vape. Then also there's another study that has, I mean, this study was actually a systematic review and a meta-analysis. What it means is that they examine a number of studies, about I think seven studies in, in total. And what they found out that those who vape were more likely to also report asthma or were more likely to have asthma. Then between 2018 and 2020, there were incidences of land injury cases that were related to vaping in the US. And actually about almost uh, 3000 uh, cases were reported across the state, I mean, across the country, as well as 68 deaths that were attributable to vaping. I mean, people dying as a result of uh, vaping. Then what about the effect on uh, the cardiovascular system? So again, there are chemicals in vaping that has been linked to increased risk of heart, heart attack, coronary artery disease, as well as stroke. I mean, one study that was done uh, found out that people who vape were about almost two times more likely to have, have a heart attack compared to those who do not vape because of I mean, the substance or the chemical substance that have been uh, found in uh, vaping products. And in other studies, those who vape were about four, point, four times likely to have, have a, I mean, report heart attack or have incidents of heart attack compared to those uh, who do not vape. But there are other studies, cross-sectional studies, which was that kind of a snapshot that also report that there are no negative effects of vaping within the short term. Right? So people who are exposed to vaping within the short term do not report and uh, neg uh, do not have any negative effect on their cardiovascular system. But I would say the evidence that seems to suggest that there are negative effects are more than uh, those that do point uh, that there are no negative cardiovascular effects. Now, with respect to cancer, the evidence are inconclusive, right? They are, I mean, we don't have enough evidence, especially in the human population. But then there was one cross-sectional retrospective study. Here, I mean, they gather data and they trace it back to kind of report their history of vaping as well as history of uh, cancer. And what they found was that those who vape were about 2.2 times more likely to have a history of cancer. And more importantly, there was a research that kind of find at least five carcinogens in vaping product. That means five of the chemicals in the, the vaping product has been identified as I mean, cancer causing substances. And as you see, I have the five uh, substances here. And I must say there are about over, I think nearly 8,000 chemicals in, the, in vaping products. And of these five has been confirmed to uh, contain or cause uh, cancer. Though I have to say the amount of these substances in the vaping product are kind of less uh, significant compared to uh, traditional uh, smoking or traditional cigarette. But then, as I said, with time, we will 
uh, begin to really uncover the true effect of uh, vaping on cancer. And mind you, when, I mean, traditional smoking started, people thought it was cool. And in the 50s, in the 20s, I mean, people were smoking just for fun. And as we see, we saw from the video, among youth, now some are just smoking, I mean, vaping for the fun of it. But we don't know what we'll find out after 20 years, after 30 years. And the evidence seems to suggest that there is a potential association, a potential risk factor for uh, developing um, cancer among those who uh, vape. Then another big one is psychological outcomes, right? There are tons of research on this uh, area, which has pointed to the fact that people who do vape are more likely to report depression, anxiety, and stress. And here, the association is bi-directional. It goes both ways. People who have mental health outcomes are also more likely to vape. And the same way, those who vape are more likely to report, I mean, the psychological or mental health outcomes. And one study reported that those who vape were about 2.1 times more likely to report a history of clinically diagnosed depression. Mind you, this is not just based on subjective diagnosis. This was based on clinical diagnosis. So the evidence is compelling that those who vape clinically uh, are more likely to report an incident of uh, depression. And the next study is a study I did with one uh, colleague here where within cancer survivors, we're trying to examine whether those who vape were more likely to uh, report incidents of uh, clinical depression. And here, these were non-smokers. So uh, it has nothing to do with I mean, smoking or traditional smoking. And after accounting for other factors such as age, other demographic variables, as well as other uh, important factors, what we found out was that those who do vape were about three times more likely to report incident of clinical uh, diagnosis of depression. And then also another review, this one was kind of a scooping review where they review a number of studies and what they found was that those who vape were more likely to have suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, and compared to those who do not vape. So as I said, the association seems to be bi-directional. Those who vape tend to think their life is worthless and more I mean, likely to commit or attempt committing uh, suicide. Now with adolescents, I um, mean, as the first presenter already said, their brain are still developing. And what uh, research has found was that those who use nicotine product, not just um, vaping, it tends to affect the brain development. And also it can I mean, alter the way synapses are formed, which can hurt parts of the brain that controls attention and also learning. So those who do vape, I don't know if you've seen it in schools, have less attention span. Those who I mean, do vape are not able to pay attention, really pay attention when they are in class because of redra symptoms. Anytime they try to stay away from I mean, tobacco or from the nicotine product, they experience redra symptoms and tend to have difficulty uh, with attention as well as learning. Then also it affects memory as well as self-control and also mood. Then with other concerns, uh, it tends to uh, affect mood and also permanent problems with impulse control. And there are research that points to that effect. Then also those who vape uh, tends to have lightheadedness eye and throat irritation headache among other negative effects. Then another effect is that those who vape tend to have also eating disorder. They are, I mean, at higher risks of reporting I mean, eating disorders. Then also poisons have been documented and other minor uh, toxic that affect, I mean, he might can, so that leads to vomiting among other stuff. So I think the bottom line is Though the marketing and the I mean, manufacturing companies tend to provide I and mean, promote it as a safer option, uh, the evidence does not support the claim that uh, vaping is safer and or I mean healthy alternative to smoking. What we can say is that it's less harmful compared to traditional smoking, but it's not safer and it's also not a healthy option.
So these are some of um, my slided uh, reference and uh, the questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Godfred. Um, there was one question in the chat. It says, is there any data on the effects of THC vapes in teenagers using these devices? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so as uh, I said, I mean, this THC tends to contain the five carcinogenic I mean, substances that I talk about. Right, though they are in less, I mean, quantity or less, I mean, compared to uh, traditional smoking, but one research finds sufficient amount of this five cancer causing substance in the THC vape. And so it's not kind of healthy for anyone, I mean, using it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Godfred, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will say thank you so much. A lot of valuable information in there. And as an educator, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So our next panelist is Mark Amen. Mark Amen is an environmental engineer with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation office in Region 8. Mark works in the Division of Materials Management, has oversight of solid waste recycling and disposal facilities in Monroe, Wayne, and Ontario counties, and provides technical assistance related to compliance with New York State solid waste management regulations. So he's here to share with us about vape disposal. And Mark. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Um, can we pull up the, the slides? Great. Okay, uh, just a disclaimer that I'm going to try to keep this presentation um, fairly general and, and not get too much into the weeds on the regulatory aspects. This is more geared toward uh, school districts in the education sector, um, nonprofit organizations and the like. Um, I also included some information for households, which I hope will be helpful. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to start with a short intro on DEC Region 8 and the Division of Materials uh, Management. For those who may not be familiar with us and what we do, there are nine DEC regions throughout the state. Region 8 has regulatory oversight of an 11 county area, which includes the Western Finger Lakes region the Rochester area and the Corning Elmira area. So the Division of Materials Management is a fairly broad ranging program. We regulate um, at the state level, the management of, of non-hazardous waste like household garbage, medical waste, industrial and commercial waste. Um, we also regulate the management of hazardous waste, pesticides, low level radioactive wastes, though that program is run out of our central office in Albany. And we regulate the transportation of these wastes. We handle the permitting and inspection of facilities that manage uh, such wastes as well. So Gregory McLean is the Regional Materials Management Engineer for Region 8. Um, I have not included his name, uh, but uh, my contact information is on the first page. Uh, and feel free to reach out to us if, if you have any questions. So if we could go to the next slide. Vaping devices and e-cigarettes are somewhat of a problematic waste stream for a number of reasons. From a regulatory standpoint, the disposal of e-liquids is subject to the hazardous waste regulations due to the nicotine. There are potential issues with the cannabis concentrate, the, the THC uh, being a controlled substance, and the batteries can cause fires if not properly managed. And there's a, the, the litter aspect, I decided to include that. The devices are easily discarded out car windows and such on sidewalks, and so they can contribute to litter. Next slide. So nicotine waste is considered an acute hazardous waste under the RECRA regulations, RECRA being the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. It is found listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, I have the citation, it's 40 CFR section 261.33E. 
and the hazardous waste number assigned by the Environmental Protection Agency is P075. Nicotine waste is also listed in the state's hazardous waste regulations under Title VI of New York Code's Rules and Regulations, Part 371.4. So why is nicotine waste considered hazardous, you might ask? And the reason is because it's been used as the active ingredient in pesticides, specifically insecticides, and has been found to be harmful in low doses to insects, both good insects, such as pollinators and bad insects, as well as animals and humans. There is an ex exception, an exclusion for nicotine patches, nicotine gum and other FDA approved over-the-counter products that contain nicotine. These do not have to be handled as hazardous waste. Um, my understanding is that some of the companies that manufacture these e-liquids like Juul have requested EPA to exclude their products, but EPA has been reluctant to do that. So for the time being, these wastes are still regulated as hazardous. Next slide, please. In New York State, a generator of a hazardous waste is required to manage that waste appropriately. For hazardous waste generators, New York State distinguishes between three general categories, depending on the amount of waste generated and stored. There is the conditionally exempt small quantity generator or CESQG, which has the least onerous requirements and where we would expect most entities like school districts to be. There are the small quantity generators and then there are the large quantity generators of hazardous waste. To be a, a CESQG of acute hazardous waste, you would be limited to generating no more than one kilogram, which is about 2.2 pounds of acute hazardous waste in a calendar month and at any time store no more than 2.2 pounds of acute hazardous waste. The good thing is uh, about the CESQG category is that you don't have to get the EPI, EPA identification number. Uh, you don't need to use the hazardous waste manifest to transport the waste. The manifest is a, a special form used to track the waste from cradle to grave. And you don't need to submit an annual report, which, which is good. So if these thresholds are exceeded, however, which would seem unlikely for a school district in most circumstances, but if these thresholds are exceeded, then the entity would fall under the large quantity generator category, which entails more obligations, such as the EPA ID number, the manifesting, there's, there's a, a training program that's required and, and a bunch of other requirements. And I've linked to this information on the DEC website uh, in the slide. Um, Next slide, please. So what does 2.2 pounds translate into in terms of the number of vaping devices? As with most things, it, it depends. That quantity refers to the actual weight of the nicotine material in the device and not to the total weight of the vaping device. So the 2.2 pounds is about 890 milliliters of e-liquid, which is a little less than a quart about 0 0.95 quarts. These devices come in different sizes and there's so much variability. The guidance provided to us by our central office is that for the larger capacities, 2.2 pounds is about 150 devices. For the smaller uh, capacity ones, it could be up to 1,780 devices. So there's, there's quite a range. And I, I think as long as the quantity is kept under 150, you should certainly be okay as far as not exceeding that 2.2 pound regulatory threshold. And uh, even if you went a little bit over 150, I would say that it's, it's uh, very unlikely. Next slide. Lithium ion batteries. These vaping devices use a lithium ion battery to heat up the e-liquid and aerosolize it. DEC recommends against discarding these batteries into the trash. We are finding that they are capable of starting fires. And in fact, this summer there was a waste trailer fire down in, in Catskill at a transfer station. The batteries were believed to be the source of the fire. The disposal of rechargeable batteries in the trash is also prohibited by the New York State Rechargeable Battery Law. And I've, I've put the, the citation on the slide. 
The law makes it illegal for any person to throw rechargeable batteries in the trash. It applies to all persons, individuals, households, businesses, non nonprofits, and so on. There are exceptions to the law. It doesn't apply to, to large batteries that weigh over 25 pounds. It doesn't apply to non uh, rechargeable batteries, and there's some other exceptions which are not uh, necessarily relevant here. The law also imposes requirements on manufacturers of rechargeable batteries who sell in New York State to fund the recycling of these batteries. The law also requires retailers that sell rechargeable batteries or rechargeable battery containing products to accept used rechargeable batteries from New York State consumers. And I've provided a link to that to the DEC website. Next slide. Monroe County has started accepting these devices at its Echo Park facility on Avian Drive near the Rochester Airport. My understanding is that it is the first permanent facility in the state to offer the service. There is a link to the website. The Echo Park is a DEC permitted facility. They accept all sorts of waste there. Uh, non-hazardous solid waste, recyclables, household hazardous waste. Um, they also accept uh, hazardous waste from conditionally exempt small quantity generators. It's uh, subject to DEC inspection. And uh, so we visit the site on a semi-regular basis. Monroe County residents can drop off vaping devices and e-cigs for free. It's open Wednesday and Saturday. The county accepts waste from out of county residents uh, is for a fee, however, and for small businesses, nonprofit organizations and school districts, there is the conditionally exempt small quantity generator program, which is also fee based. Monroe County contracts with Clean Harbors. They're a waste disposal and recycling company. Clean Harbors packs it into containers and transports it to their hazardous waste incinerator. I believe it's down in El Dorado in Arkansas. The county also has a chemist on site who looks through the devices. They are finding that some of the devices being turned in by the schools contain cannabis and uh, those cartridges are removed and disposed of uh, separately with their pharmaceutical waste. Next slide. Schools and other organizations that would like to use the Echo Park will need to send in a conditionally exempt small quantity generator certification form. The form is available on the Echo Park website and the program contact is Steve Stratton. I provided his contact information on the slide. I'm told they typically accept the devices in one or two gallon buckets. The county advises not removing the battery. The school district self-transport the containers. An entity can bring a, a check or up to be invoiced and the, and the county will send a bill and the, the school districts, from what I am told, typically bring a check. Next slide. And this is uh, just a picture of uh, that certification form. Next slide, please. Other options besides the Echo Park are fairly limited for managing the waste. In fact, the only other option that we are aware of is that a school district can contract elect directly with a waste company. Clean Harbors is one such company. I've been told that Veolia is another possibility. There are probably others, but of, of course, DEC cannot endorse any particular company. Currently, there are no laws requiring manufacturers and sellers to take back vaping devices and e-cigs. That may change at some point in the future, but it is not currently the case. The DEC website says that the DEC pharmaceutical kiosks accept electronic vaping devices and cartridges. These kiosks are intended to provide a convenience for the public. They are not really intended for use by school districts, police agencies, and other organizations. Next slide, please. Households have a number of options. They can take them to the Echo Park or to a collection event, but to my knowledge, there are no collection events that are accepting these. Um, hopefully that will change. Uh, for instance, Ontario County refers the residents to the Echo Park. So I think they're the only game in town and will be for a while. There may be some other events around the state, but uh, we typically refer households to the Echo Park. 
they could use the DEC pharmaceutical collection kiosks. The uh, picture to the right shows places around the state uh, where these kiosks are located and, and that link in the slide will, will take you to the, the DEC website where you can look up the exact locations of these participating sites. There is the DEA's drug take back collection program. The link takes you to the website and you can search for a participating pharmaceutical disposal location. They will accept vape, vaping devices from households, but they request that the battery be removed first. And on the topic of batteries, um, I've included a link to Call to Recycle, which is the program New York State uses for rechargeable battery recycling services. There are drop-off locations around the state. I know Walmart is one such place that accepts them. There are others. So that concludes my presentation. If anybody has any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but that doesn't mean that people are still typing. Um, but I think that we definitely look at vaping from a health and behavioral health perspective. Um, so we really appreciate you coming to share the information on how it affects our environment as well, which I think is something that not many people think of, including myself, until I began my conversations with you. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. My pleasure. All right, so our next featured panelists will, will actually be two people um, from Delphi Rise. It is Jackie Petzing and Kevin Dix. Both of them were raised in Wayne County, and both of them hold master's degrees in mental health counseling from St. John Fisher College. So Jackie recently joined Delphi Rise Prevention Team, working as a school-based counselor educator in the SOTUS Intermediate and Junior High Schools. And Kevin has been with Delphi Rise as a prevention counselor at the Red Creek School District for the past three years and also works in private practice. So the two of them will be speaking on youth addiction and mental health. Can you see that? Everyone sees that? Okay. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Jackie Putzing from Delphi Rise. I'm Kevin. Thanks for the introduction, by the way. I uh, really appreciate that. It is our hope that we are going to highlight the connection between uh, mental health and addiction. Um, sometimes we can talk about the substance use crisis in a silo and also mental health crisis in a silo, but we want to highlight the connection between the two. And I'd like to start with a little call to action. Now, hopefully we can get some participants to throw in a guess. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think the percentage of adults who meet the criteria for having a substance use disorder? Um, I can't even see myself. Okay, so what percentage of adults who met the criteria for having a substance use disorder started using substances during their teen and young adult years? So whoever's uh, monitoring the chat, if anyone decides to answer, will you let us know what the guesses are? The answers are flying and jaggy. Yeah. I, can't, I can't see anything. <laughs> Is there's there's a like, are they really? And they're kind of all over the place. There's some 50, some 90, some 75s. Okay. Well, the answer is 90. 90% 90 of adults that currently meet the criteria for substance use disorder started using in their um, teen and young adult years. So I think that really highlights the importance of focusing on teen use. And um, a lot of what Kevin and I do with our work in prevention is try and delay the onset of use because imagine the ripple effect, the impact it would have on that, that uh, those, the adults who meet that criteria later in life. So this question too, I'd like you to keep in mind as we watch the next video, is team vape use generally rebellious behavior? Okay, so I'll let you know, Jay. We got didn't need sound, so gross and not surprising, right? So we, I'll just kind of summarize for a second. But we so we essentially see two girls in the bathroom. Uh, one girl drops her vape device into the toilet. Uh, the other girl is looking on her with judge judgment, and she reaches into the toilet to pull the vape out, blows it off, and and uh, decides to hit the vape. 
and you can see the disgust on on the girl's face um this video is uh you know really short really sweet and gets to the point of addiction and nicotine addiction in specific okay so again um highlighting this connection between mental health and substance use it's kind of when you're dealing with someone that might have co-occurring disorder, there, um, there's this question of kind of what came first, like the chicken or the egg, right? Was it a mental illness that led to substance use? Was it substance use that led to mental illness? And teasing through that is sometimes very difficult. And research, research suggests that adolescents with substance use disorder also have high rates of co-occurring mental illness. So I wanted to kind of hone in on the vape use for a second here. And um, one of the common misconceptions is that nicotine relieves stress, anxiety, and depression. And the thing is, it does temporarily. And I think a lot of teens don't, you know, have that forward thinking and um, can't see past that I feel good in this moment. And the prevalence and anxiety symptoms in youth has doubled compared to before the pandemic. So what that leads to is some teens, a large majority of teens that are experimenting with nicotine to deal with these increasing symptoms, this distress. And then nicotine actually has the very opposite effect. It worsens mental health symptoms. So you layer on another, an, another layer is that the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal are irritability, anxiety, and depression. So now you have teens that continue using to cope with these symptoms. And then it just creates the self-perpetuating cycle of addiction and despair, this very dangerous feedback loop. So this next video, hopefully the volume will come through. I don't know how to fix that um, on my end. So, so I don't know, Kevin, I can see you. Maybe you can give me a thumbs up if I need to if it's good to go. What you need to do is when you share your screen, click the two little buttons at the bottom before you actually start sharing. And the buttons are how to share sound. Right. So stop sharing now, then then hit the share button and then click those two buttons. All right, let me do that then. I'll stop sharing. And now I've got to share. And at the very bottom, there's share two things, sound. share sound and optimize for video clip. Uh, that one is not clickable for me, but I'll go with that, share. Hopefully that'll be yeah. better. Okay. Okay.
So thoughts on that. I like that video because it kind of demonstrates that cycle that I talked about, that perpetuating cycle. And I also, in the beginning of that video, you see the little bird character checking out the nugget out of curiosity, just simple curiosity and how it evolved into a full-blown addiction. So what are your thoughts on that? Anyone, does anyone have thoughts on that? Um, you do have some people in the chat. Uh, Lindsay Robbins said, great depiction of addiction. Um, that was great, love this video. Yeah, that's one that stuck with me. So I wanted to throw it in there and put it out to the universe. But, so um, let me see, I'm just trying to figure out how to work my screen again, going, toggling between the two. It's not my... Okay. There we go, okay. I'm just gonna try to go through a lot of this pretty quickly. Um, so here I'm just, I'm really trying to focus on um, addiction and substance use to kind of focus on that piece in general. So uh, I'm kind of going off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which you see up top, this little triangle piece. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, so you kind of see these different stages um, that, that are necessary really to build on to self-actualization, you know, a full, fully functioning, healthy, idealized adult. Um, so if some of these needs like food or shelter aren't met, it's hard to kind of advance along um, the spectrum. So the reason I'm bringing this up is to kind of point to factors that contribute to using substances. And the big piece that I want to emphasize on is the environmental factors, um, because most of these factors, uh, you know, really all the other factors may or may not be in the environmental. And when I'm talking about environment, I'm talking about the home life typically. Um, so all of these kind of contribute back and forth. Uh, if, if there's pieces that are lacking in the environmental factors, uh, like healthy attachment, um, there's going to be, there can be a greater or an increased chance for substance use. If there's a history of substance use in the home, family history of substance use, there's a greater chance. If there's a history of trauma and abuse, when sometimes these kind of go together, there's a greater chance. If there's family conflicts, um, high frequency, some violence, verbal violence, there's a greater chance. Existing mental disorders or the experience of symptomology, oftentimes see individuals that present with some depressive or anxiety symptoms, um, that's going to kind of boost the chance. If many of these things are present, uh, it can create a higher need for social acceptance greater than what already exists, as you know, many teens and, and youth are already striving for social acceptance. But if you're deprived of healthy attachments, if you've gone through abuse, you may be seeking that even more. And that's going to kind of drive you, it, it can drive your risk up even more. And then obviously genetics, um, you know, genetics do play a role, especially if there's a history, um, but keeping in mind that genetics, even if they're there, they have to be triggered by something in the environment to actually kind of activate that, if that makes sense. Um, so just, I realized there was two minutes. Where am I, where am I at now, Jill? You're okay, go ahead and do your thing. Okay, yeah. All right, so, okay. Yeah, I'm good, Jackie, if you wanna move on. Uh, so I'm just gonna kind of really quickly go through um, the way nicotine interacts with the brain um, without getting too in depth. For me, it helps to kind of think of it this way, especially in terms of addiction, because addiction is such a mass. It, it, it impacts so many different ways of, of life and just so many different systems. So when I can think of it this way, it helps. So I try to explain it this way. So. In a natural state, our pre-existing nicotinic acetylcholine receptors serve as a critical component of the cholinerg cholinergic system of neurotransmission in the brain that modulates important physiological processes such as reward, cognition, and mood. Reward's a big one here. So when we introduce nicotine to our bodies, nicotine binds to our nicotinic receptors, signaling a release of dopamine at a level much higher than will be released through natural healthy activities. Nicotine, like cocaine and heroin, takes over the brain pathways that control pleasure. This reward pathway starts in the ventral tag, uh, tag mental area where the cells are covered with nicotine receptors and make the chemical do dopamine. From there, these cells connect to the nucleus accumbens, which influences reward and pleasure, and the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with decision-making. 
Okay, Jackie, I'm good. So to try to summarize this in some in a, in a little bit more basic terms. So when we experience something rewarding and or pleasurable, our body utilizes multiple processes to be sure we remember. It's very important that we remember things that reward us, um, just, just as it's important that we remember things that might harm us or, or put us in danger. Our reward pathway interacts with the amygdala and hippocampus, which belong to our limbic system, which is kind of the emotional feeling systems. They're responsible for a lot of that. Um, so when we experience a reward, the system focuses on storing the emotion and, and we associate that with the outcome and the experience. So we very much remember, oh, you know, I ate the best meal of my life at so-and-so's and I remember the feeling I had during, I remember how I felt after I ate. And then impacts to the hippocampus, which influence memory and process of learning reward. If I reach my goal, I feel good. So you, we learn like, oh, if I, if I reach this, I'm going to feel good. And it becomes a repeated behavior because we kind of take that knowledge forward. Finally, the frontal lobes are activated and this interacts with our conscious experience of the pleasure or award being experienced. So there are a lot of different parts at play that kind of dictate how you know, we experience this reward pathway and how we learn that reward's good for us and how we learn to internalize the emotion and how we feel when we feel that reward. Okay. So I wanted to kind of summarize with this real quickly um, on this reward pathway piece. And I got this from a study that um, was conducted over cross analysis of multiple studies on the impacts of vaping and teen use. And this was touched on earlier tonight, but the big piece to take away is that for, for, for teens and adolescents, um, the reward response is overreactive. And you can think of why it might be for, for survival reasons, but also this could be at the detriment when you're engaging in substance use that is highly addictive, i.e. nicotine. Um, and some numbers that I pulled from the study, uh, a survey in high school seniors revealed that 88% of teen smokers were also consuming alcohol, while 55% of non-smokers were consumers of alcohol. So kind of putting that connection of substance to substance. Um, okay, so another piece that they pulled on in this in the study, which was from an older study um, in 1994, was that uh, uh, of a household survey on drug abuse for individuals who smoke cigarettes before age 15 were 80 times more likely to use illegal drugs than those who did not, which is a very alarming num a number, um, but makes sense when you're thinking about the reward pathway and how strong it is and how strongly it's activated at that age. And then the other piece from this was that teens who use e-cigarettes are more than three times more likely to use marijuana. So another um, comor comorbidity or co-concurrent use, um, which speaks you know more and more to to the concern of vape use. You know, you start here and especially if you're starting young, the likelihood of it leading onto something else is rather high. And then I wanted to just conclude with this final piece. Um, so, but vaping is supposed to be safe or alternative. We all know it's not, but, um, and although there have been limited studies that expand on the long-term biological impacts of vaping, it is clear that nicotine addiction is still just as concerning as it's always been. Addiction poses many implications to mental health and vice versa. The piece I kind of want to end on is, you know, it, it, I, I do deliver some educational content on substance use uh, in the school format. Um, and a lot of it is on the biological impacts, but, the, you know, the focus could very well be on addiction because addiction here is really the big piece that I feel like is not talked about as much. And you see it and, and you know, I see it on, in the, at the forefront. I see it on the front lines withdrawal from nicotine, especially from vape use is very real and um, we're kind of dealing with it all the time. So yeah, sorry, I really went really fast, um, but does anyone have any questions about anything that Jackie and I have shared? I don't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has any, feel free to um, throw them in there and we will direct them to Kevin and Jackie. Uh, thank you both very much for being here. Uh, Delphi Rice plays a really important role in prevention in our schools, and I know Wayne County is grateful for your partnership. So uh, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. All right. So I think I am actually our next panelist. So aside from being an organizer, I am also presenting here tonight. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. 
All right, hopefully you all can see that. Um, my name is Sydney Pfaff. I am the Wayne County Community Prevention Educator for the Council on Alcoholism and Addictions of the Finger Lakes. Um, I also co-chair the Wayne Wellness Work Group that had a part in organizing this. Um, and I am here to talk about leaping and youth. And I might go kind of quickly because I know that we're running short on time. I don't want to take time from any way away from anybody else. Um, but even though vaping and youth is a pretty broad topic, I have narrowed it down to just a couple of things that I want to talk to you about today. Um, so I will be talking about how to recognize the signs of vaping, how to talk to teens about vaping, both preventatively and if they are actually vaping. Um, I have some resources that I want to share, and then we'll have time for questions as well. So as far as recognizing the signs of vaping, um, this of course isn't a complete list, but everything on here really should be just, you know, uh, something that can lead to more questions if you happen to run into something like this. Um, so the first one, which sounds kind of self-explanatory is to find the equipment, finding an e-cigarette, finding a vape. Um, but the reason I put this on here is because we might not know what those vapes look like. Um, a lot of them resemble just like regular writing pens or USB drives. If you don't know what to look for, you might be looking right at a vape and not know. So it really is just a matter of keeping up with trends and what those devices look like. Um, unexplained purchases could be a sign. So actually, a lot of young people are getting their vapes or e-cigarettes from online sites. I know perfectvape.com is a common one that I hear from Wayne County Youth that they are purchasing hide vapes from, um, or they're getting them from friends at school who are purchasing them on perfectvape.com. But if your child has a debit card or you know your student has a debit card, that could be something that they would be purchasing. So if you're a parent, you want to be monitoring any packages that are coming into the home. Um, the scent. Uh, so I can't say exactly what it'll smell like because they have all different flavors and different scents, but a lot of young people are vaping really fruity flavors. So if you're walking into the school bathroom or you're walking into your child's bedroom and it smells like a brand new air freshener in there and you're like, my kid would never buy their air freshener on their own, um, that should probably be a question. Um, that, gets, that scent can linger in the area for quite a long time after they are vaping. Um, behavioral changes. There are a number of things that fall into this category. Um, you are going to be looking for any signs of withdrawal. Um, so irritability, lack of sleep and appetite, um, inability to focus. And not to say that every time a teenager is irritable, that means they're a nicotine withdrawal, but that is something to look out for. Um, also just any other changes in behavior. Maybe they're spending a lot of time in their bedroom or a long time in the bathroom at school, um, or they're taking frequent walks outside. Um, that could be just something to lead to some more questions. Um, making frequent complaints. So if you are noticing that a young person is complaining of stomach aches or nausea or headaches, uh, having a cough, not being able to fall asleep at night, um, those could be signs of nicotine use and withdrawal. And if that's a frequent thing, um, you should be asking questions. And lastly, social media. So I know not all parents and not all uh, school administrators, that's for sure, are able to monitor their students or their child's social media accounts. But if you do have access to that, that is something that you want to be looking for, looking for references to vaping or actual images of, you know, vapes in their hands or um, their friends or themselves actually vaping. And again, this is not a complete list, but these are just some signs, um, some things to look for and ask some additional questions. So how to talk to teens about vaping. Um, when I was putting this together, I was wondering if I should, you know, gear it towards parents or towards school personnel or coaches or other caring adults. And what I found was actually my advice is pretty much the same across the board. So no matter who you are, if you're caring an adult, um, this applies to you. Um, so ideally, we want to be having these conversations about vaping before that young person ever vapes. And I think one of the best ways to do that is through teachable moments. And what I mean by that are like authentic, everyday opportunities where you can find to just kind of plant a seed about vaping, right? So you can talk about it in a casual and non-confrontational way. So maybe you're riding in the car with your with your teen and you look over and the person in the car next to you is vaping. Um, that could be a conversation starter. You know, wow, that vaping has gotten really popular. Do you have any friends that? Vape, you know, so just kind of again planting seeds and talking about it as much as possible in a non confrontational way. Um, also, we want to make sure that we're meeting them with accurate information. So I'm very happy to see all these people here tonight because you all took advantage of this opportunity to learn more so that you can meet young people with accurate information. Um, there's also a million online resources from a lot of reputable sources, but I will say as far as keeping up with trends and knowing what the kids are up to, um, asking them themselves. So the teens that I work with are some of the best sources of information as far as what kids are doing, because if something is happening in the teenage community, it's certainly not going to be on the CDC website um, for several months, right? So asking them is a really good way to find out what really is going on. And uh, you'd be surprised what they're willing to tell you, honestly. 
Um, and I also just want to say it's okay not to know everything. So I don't want you to um, feel like you can't talk about vaping because you don't know, you don't have all the answers to all their questions, or maybe you don't know everything. Don't let that deter you because it is impossible to know everything. Okay. I am a drug and alcohol educator and I'm still learning new things about vaping every day, but you shouldn't let that deter you from having the conversation in the first place. And it's okay to say, I don't know, but let's find out if you don't have an answer. Um, lastly, expectations. Um, so I know we talk a lot about vaping being um, an addiction and not a behavioral side to it, but I understand that there are consequences for vaping in school and in most homes there are consequences for vaping as well. Um, but you want to tell them those consequences ahead of time, you know, so you want to explicitly tell them the rules and expectations. Um, if they vape, this will happen. Right. So that, you know, maybe if they're in, you know, on the bus at school and they're offered a vape for the first time, then that threat of being grounded or being suspended might be the first thing to come to their mind. And that might be the reason that they say no and delay that onset of use. So um, letting them know those expectations ahead of time. So what do we do if someone is actually vaping? Um, the first thing I will recommend to you is to not be so reactive. So I know that if you catch a young person vaping, you find out that someone you care about is engaging in that activity. Um, it's normal to be angry and upset and maybe feel like your trust was betrayed or you feel like you've been disrespected. Um, but for now, we need to just kind of take a deep breath and put that aside and really just think before we go and have that conversation. Because if we're reactive and we're full of um, lots of emotion, that conversation might not go um, in the right direction. So I always recommend to think about what you're up against because it's not just you battling your teen, right? Um, you and your teen are both up against addiction, targeted marketing. I mean, this is big tobacco, essentially, right? There's peer pressure, there's social media influence. There's a lot of things um, that you have to combat with your teen. So reminding yourself all the things that you're up against and it's not just that young person. Um, and just reminding yourself of your stance. I mean, ultimately, as adults, we do this and we have these conversations and we have these rules because we care, right? Uh, we might be angry and frustrated and all those other things too, but ultimately we care. And so the words that you use when you're in a conversation with a young person really should come from that place of caring. So as far as what to say, um, I always recommend to parents and to other caring adults um, to ask questions and listen first. Um, so you want to get as much information from that young person as you can. Um, and don't cut them off. Don't feel, don't, you know, be judgmental. Just be calm and listening and try to understand. Um, asking them these questions will help you support this person through hopefully their quitting process, right? And will help you understand why this happened in the first place. So really um, listen before you lecture. Um, but of course, lecture comes next. So you want to meet them with facts and concern. And again, say, I really care about you. And this is why, you know, I'm upset that you're doing this because it's bad for you for this reason, this reason, and this reason, right? So again, coming from that place of care and concern. Um, explain any consequences, but try not to let this become the focus because again, those consequences and those rules only exist because we care about that young person. And then lastly, connecting, connecting them to quitting resources, which we're going to hear more about later tonight, um, but most importantly, offering support through that quitting process. So it really is important for adults in a young person's life to support them. Um, and if you think that that teenager is going to get on that quitting app and, and do it every day and really be successful and do it all on your own, I think that we're mistaken in thinking that. I think that there really needs to be support from a lot of different people, and that includes the caring adults in their life. So definitely supporting them through the quitting process. Um, I have a couple of just like additional resources for you to check out. So um, the Hidden in Plain site, which was given a shout out by Shane earlier from Marion. So thank you for that, Shane. Um, that is a council program that we offer for free um, anywhere in Wayne County. Um, so you can request that to be in your school or your community. And that is a really great training. It's not specifically focused on vaping, but if you are looking to be more familiar with the paraphernalia and what vapes actually look like and looking to get some more information, that is great training for you. Um, I also have a family information guide. Um, that QR code will take you to that. I'll also put the links in the chat here when I'm done. Um, but that's the most comprehensive guide for vaping that I found for families throughout all of my research. So I wanted to share that. And lastly, I went really quickly through how to have those conversations, but the American Lung Association um, provides an entire comprehensive um, conversation guide so that you know exactly what to say and um, what angle to come from when you're having those tough conversations with young people. So that's another resource I highly recommend. And again, I will put those links in the chat um, if you haven't scanned them on your phone and you would like access to them. 
and um, I have time for any questions, if there are any. Yeah, so a, a few questions did come in, um, Sydney. We had, well, first you were talking about um, the signs and how it might smell like a fruity flavor. And one person said that, you know, there are some people that might be using like a body spray or something to cover that up. But then we also had um, a question and I just wanna get to it so that I say it right. How can I help someone stop vaping without getting them in trouble? And I know that there are going to be some presenters that might um, have a perspective on that. And a few people have given some resources, like for instance, calling 1-866 New York Quits, the quit line. Um, and there's also the Truth Initiative, which people can sign up for. Um, and I'm wondering if you might have anything to add to that, Sydney. Um, so I think that, yeah, anything that you can refer them to that maybe isn't a school-based, I'm assuming this is a school-based question, um, if you're worried about getting that student in trouble, um, anything that you can refer them to, but also I think that it just, it depends on the school district and the policies that you have in place, but I certainly think that, you know, if that young person is looking for help, um, I personally don't see how that's a punitive measure, but it might fall into that category just based on what the school's code of conduct is. Um, but I think if you're coming from a place of caring and you're trying to connect that person to local resources, which Carrie's going to talk about later on today, um, I don't think there's any harm in that. And I can't speak to that because I'm not your boss <laughs> and I don't want to get those students in trouble either, but I guess that's that's my answer. All right, awesome, Sydney. Um, I think the person who wrote that question, I think you are gonna get um, some good answers coming up at the next presentations in addition to what Sydney just said. Um, all right, so our next presenter is Lindsay Robbins. And Lindsay is the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Tobacco Action Coalition, Coalition of the Finger Lakes. And with the focus of promoting tobacco-free policies, it is funded by a grant from New York State Bureau of Tobacco Control to the American Lung Association. Lindsay is going to share some information regarding social media effects on vaping in our community and will provide some information to help reduce vaping. Go ahead, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Tina. So my name is Lindsay Robbins. I am with the Tobacco Action Coalition of the Finger Lakes and I will be focusing on vaping and media influences. Um, so just a quick background. Um, so I am with the Tobacco um, Action Coalition, the Finger Lakes, and we are a grant funded program from the New York State Tobacco um, Bureau Control to the American Lung Association. Um, we are one of 25 advancing uh, tobacco-free community contracts in New York State, working to change the community environment to support New York State's tobacco-free norm. And we um, cover specifically Wayne, Ontario, Seneca, and Yates County. Um, so just a little bit brief background. We focus primarily on four initiatives, smoke-free outdoors, smoke-free multi-unit housing, and smoke-free media, and then also the point of sale. All right, so um, social media and youth. So teens watch on an average of um, almost 11 hours of media on a, any given day. The media youth consume is often completely unregulated, giving the tobacco industry direct access to the teens daily lives and teens are consuming more media than ever. And uh, just to point out, I grew up in a generation where tobacco, or I'm sorry, where social media was just becoming a big thing when I was middle and high school. I cannot imagine what it is like 10, 15 years later. Um, so just a quick little overview. So Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, and TikTok are um, primary social media and platforms that teens are utilizing. Um, so 95% of teenagers in 2022 report to have smartphone or access to one and 90% report to have a laptop or computer or access to one. Um, and YouTube is become the most popular social media platform with 85% of 13 to 17 year olds using it. All right, so big tobacco and internet marketing. Um, as teens spend more and more time on the web, big tobacco spends more and more cash on the internet marketing. It is average around $1 million per hour in the United States that big tobacco spends on the marketing. Um, so they just have, you know, endless funds to do this, and they remain very wealthy and powerful. 
unfortunately. Um, there are no, currently there are no state or federal laws regulating how the tobacco industry markets on the web. This gives the industry free range to target youth in new COVID ways through buzz or viral marketing. Um, and the tobacco industry uses the media to target youth by having their favorite actors, actresses light up on both television and movie screens. So it's outside of social media. Um, so combustible cigarettes are prohibited by law and traditional media, but vaping is not as regulated. If there is any regulation, it's based on social media apps, so individual, individual platforms making different decisions on what they allow. So Instagram has the largest of e-cigarette social media marketing. Um, this is done primarily through um, like influencers. So Instagram does not permit e-cigarette and vape manufacturers um, to pay for promoted posts about their products, but these companies can pay influencers to post content. Influencers play a central role in e-cigarette social media marketing with 75% of influencers who do promote e-cigarette products on Instagram do not restrict youth access. So in other words, um, youth have all free range to have access to these um, content creators who do promote vaping. Um, so this is just a post that kind of goes over even just like they're not a typical influencer, it's just a content creator or just someone who is posting about vaping. And you know, with all the hashtags, it can be very easy to find as well. And it somewhat glamorizes it as well with all the comments about, you know, it's a, a gorgeous shot and all that stuff. So social media effects on vaping. Um, tobacco related imagery via ads or via content creators portray tobacco products to be okay or cool or normalized. Um, see, and e-cigarettes and vaping are definitely glamorized in the media or in movies, TV shows. Um, exposure to visual posts featuring e-cigarettes products on social media are associated with an increased e-cigarette use among adolescents in the United States, according to a study that was done by Stanford University. Frequent exposure to smoking and vaping imagery on screens can make youth and adults twice as likely to start smoking. Um, and 44% of adolescents who start smoking do because they've seen these images in movies, according to the Truth Initiative. And then there's just some other posts that somewhat glamorize um, vaping on Instagram. So read normalization of tobacco imagery during popular streaming shows. There's been an increase of binge watching TV shows and movies on streaming services. And research was done to analyze the top binge watch shows and results that 44% of those shows include tobacco depictions. So just a, some quick examples, um, Stranger Things season three that came out in 2019 had a total of 721 tobacco imagery moments. Uh, the Queen's Gambit, which was a very popular show when uh, COVID kind of hit, uh, tobacco imagery was in every episode of that season. And uh, Bella Umbrella Academy um, tripled tobacco imagery seen since the previous season. So lots of exposure there. And here's just an infographic from Truth Initiative. We love to use Truth Initiative as a great infographics and great data. Um, so basically just summarizing some things that I said and some other statistics um, just on how much there is tobacco and vaping and media and how much exposure there really is. So some general so solutions to this. Um, stronger flavor ban policies or vaping policies can be one. Um, better regulating e-cigarette content. Education is key and the key to prevention. And keep fighting for policy change. Some more specific solutions can be to utilize other content creators to develop anti-tobacco and vaping policies and promote those policies to followers. So more positive outlook on it and anti-tobacco. Number two is to run successful anti-tobacco and electronic cigarette ads on social media platforms featuring tobacco imagery. Um, third one is to take part in anti-vaping anti -vaping campaigns to help spread knowledge. Um, so for one example, American Lung Association launched the hashtag do the vape talk. And then Truth Initiative has many various campaigns like Breath of Fresh Air and stuff that go into detail about um, you know, vaping resources and bringing to light about how much tobacco imagery there is out there. And the number four is um, somewhat of a little plug for us, but to become part of Reality Check, 
Um, so that's our youth component program. It's a youth led movement in New York State and reality check leaders are educating and mobilizing their peers, schools, parents, and other key leaders to influence decision makers in movie and media industry to create changes that protect our children. So basically you, um, using the youth voice to demand societal support to hold the tobacco industry accountable for its actions and change the societal norms. Um, so here's another way that we can kind of utilize our smartphones since kids have such high access to them um, and more of a positive light with all of this. So I thought this infographic was pretty clever. So using them to look up things like countries that ban e-cigarettes, the toxic chemicals that are in them, popcorn lung, um, the different chemicals that are in them, and so on. And then just to kind of summarize everything, according to many studies in recent years, increased exposure to vaping in any form of media, including social media, movies, streaming platforms, video games, all have a direct link to the increase of vaping and smoking rates among the youth in the community. So social media influences e-cigarettes use escalation via positive smoking beliefs, and social media influences e-cigarette use initiation and escalation. And that is about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for being here. Um, I do not see any questions in the chat, but if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in there and we will direct them to Lindsay later on. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. So we're running to the last 10 minutes of our presentation, but um, I do have confirmation that um, the speakers who are remaining will be able to present. So we're hoping that you can hang on. Our Zoom will not end right at 8.30. It can go on. And we have had some awesome content. And we know that the next two presentations are really focused on action steps. So the, one of the main purposes of this whole panel is to really help motivate people to quit and to help find resources to quit. So our very next presenter is Carrie Van Aken. He, she is our Deputy Director in Wayne County Public Health. She comes to us after working um, 17 years for Seneca County Public Health in various roles. She has a bachelor's degree in health science from SUNY Brockport and a master's in public health from the State University at Albany. Tonight, she will be presenting on the topic of local quit resources and sharing tips for teens and adults. Go ahead, Carrie. Great. All right. Can everybody see this? All right. Perfect. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Sydney. Um, I do want to introduce um, Lizzie Ferguson, who is sitting behind me. She is our public health educator and um, actually is the individual who um, offers and facilitates the resources that we're going to be talking about. And she does an excellent job at that, as Shane stated, for one of the schools that we're working with. Um, so one of the um, programs that we offer in terms of cessation um, resources for Wayne County youth is a program called In-Depth. Um, this is a program that was developed by the American Lung Association. As Shane stated, we are using this program in Marion, um, and we um, have the ability to offer this in other school districts as well who are interested, as well as connect local school districts to the resource um, that they can actually get their staff trained free of charge in delivering this program themselves if they prefer to have somebody in-house who's more familiar with the students um, deliver the program. It is free of charge and it takes about two and a half hours um, to get the certification for the in-depth program uh, off the American Lung Associate Association's website. Um, it is a program that serves as an alternative to suspension or citation for violations of um, student codes of conduct related to vaping um, on school campuses or other school tobacco and e-cigarette policies. Um, as I stated, it is conducted by certified ALA facilitators. So um, at this point, Wayne County Public Health has two individuals who are certified to offer in-depth. Um, right now, we have both of them conducting the sessions together, um, although we can definitely have them do as 
the demand for the program may increase. Hopefully after this program, we can actually have them go out into different um, school districts. It's a four session um, program that can be done. We're pretty flexible. Um, Lizzie offers either once a week for four weeks, or we'll do it, um, you know, four consecutive days in a row, um, or, you know, four sessions consecutively, depending on um, what the availability of the student is, um, how quickly the administration wants the student to receive the program. Um, it is 50 minutes per session, um, and it can be delivered in person, or we have the ability to offer to also offer it by Zoom if needed. Um, if we offered it by Zoom, we would request that the school district have um, somebody from the district with the student just to make sure that there's some participation there by the student um, with the district for accountability purposes. Um, the next resource that we have, so I wanted to clarify the difference between the two. One is, the in-depth program is the um, program that's an alternative to suspension for those that um, have been in violation of policies um, regarding vapes, but the Not on Tobacco program is a voluntary youth cessation program. Um, it's specifically targeted for youth ages 14 to 19 years of age. It is a nine-week program, but it consists of 10 sessions because um, week nine and 10 um, are done within the same week because it involves the quit day, correct? Five and six are done because it involves the quit day. Um, it again is conducted by trained facilitators um, in person or virtually if needed, preferably in a small group setting. Generally between um, six to 10 students is recommended. We are um, currently offering this program at Paul Mac and we have how many students? We have five. We have five students currently participating and they are on week. We're entering week seven or eight, I believe. Yep. So we're we're getting towards the end of the um, program at Paul Mac. Um, the program curriculum consists of assisting teens in identifying their nicotine dependence. So again, this program is really trying to help the the youth who are addicted um, to vaping or nicotine. Um, you know, they can also if they are cigarette smokers or using other forms of nicotine can certainly um, participate in the not on tobacco program as well. Um, it helps them to identify their nicotine dependence and establish healthy alternative behaviors. It also works um, with them to increase their social connectedness and for them to rely on their peers for additional support for the other kids in the program or um, to seek out those adults who they feel that, that could help them in their um, quit attempts. And we do at this um, current time, we have two individuals who are also trained uh, in that on tobacco. Um, so we could offer this in more than one location at, at a given time if needed. So flipping the switch from youth to adults, um, here at the county, we also have an adult nicotine cessation program. We've um, had this program for a very long time. Um, the previous uh, health educator, Ryan Mulhern, um, started this program well over a decade ago, where we have been providing nicotine replacement therapy to adults 18 and over. Um, we offer patches, the lozenges, and the gum. We will supply an individual who is interested in quitting and has um, been compliant with their um, every two week checkups or um, it, if they're not coming every two weeks or at least uh, making progress in their quit attempts, um, we will supply them with nicotine replacement therapy for up to six months. Um, we also offer individualized counseling sessions and personalized education and quit plans. Um, we are able to check in with them by phone. Um, we prefer that they come in person just so that we can have that face-to-face -face with them, see how things are going, um, see how they're managing um, 
any triggers in their life or if they're having difficulties. Um, and then of course we do um, see them in person so that we can give them their next supply of nicotine replacement therapy because we only provide them um, with a supply long enough to last them for two weeks. And then they have to come back in and get the rest. Um, while we're doing those adult cessation um, services, we also provide them with education um, as well. We certainly also encourage them to use the New York State Smokers Quit Line um, to connect with a quit coach 24-7 um, um, because obviously public health employees don't work uh, 24 hours a day. So if they are having difficulty, they can call the New York State Smokers Quit Line. We make that referral um, repeatedly and, and encourage them to do so. Um, and they can also get additional NRT um, from, from the Quit Line um, as well once they're done with us if they are um, still struggling uh, to quit smoking. In terms of our outreach and education, um, so the Great American Smokeout is coming up. And I know that um, Scott is gonna talk about this in a few minutes, um, just to give you an idea of what we're doing here um, at the county. We have um, started an initiative that we're going to um, have quick kits at the county libraries in observance of the Great American Smokeout, um, as well as promote our cessation services. Um, to let residents know that if they would like to quit smoking, then we do have um, resources available for them. Um, of course, Lizzie um, is always available to attend a health fair or do presentations on the health risks of smoking and vaping. Um, we do a lot of outreach and education with our social media sites. Um, and we also encourage um, youth who may not be interested in doing an in-person session to check out some apps like This Is Quitting, which is the Truth Initiative's um, texting app. If you just text Ditch Vape to 88709, you will be connected um, with somebody on the other end who's willing to chat with you about um, your vaping addiction and give you some tips and resources. Um, just a quick overview of all of our social medias. Um, if you click on any of these QR codes, it will take you to our social media pages um, so that you can follow us on all of these sites. And questions or comments for us. So thank you, Carrie and Lizzie. Um, I do see one question in the chat. It says, do you know how effective the NOT program is for teens? I know that the American Lung Association says that it's evidence-based. I know that it is, um, it's developed around the social cognitive theory. Um, do they have any in the training? Did they talk about the effectiveness? They did talk about the effectiveness, um, I don't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but it does track it with surveys the students have to take before and after. Right. Yeah, there are pre and post surveys before and after so that we can get an idea of whether or not they, you know, were able to cut down or quit successfully. But at this point, um, we don't have that any data right now um, because we really just launched um, not with um, Paul Mack. So we'll let you know. <laughs> I do want to say too, just because I've been on the American Lung Association website, there might be something when you um, are looking at the program, there might be some additional yeah. data as effectiveness. So that's worth checking out. Um, there was another question that says, do you have materials for schools on some of the quitting resources? Their material. I mean, we can use, um, the in-depth is certainly free and that we have materials through that um, particular resource. Um, and any of the, you know, if individuals wanted some of the lessons from the American Lung Association's NAP program, I'm sure that we could make those available. There's other, um, you know, programs as well, like Catch My Breath, um, that we have PowerPoints um, and resources available for to um, that we can provide to schools. Awesome. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing this information with us tonight. 
Hey, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for hanging on. We have our final presenter of the evening. We have Dr. Scott McIntosh. He is a professor of public health sciences and research director in the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Rochester. He's a co-director of the Nicotine and Tobacco Research Corps in the Wilmot Cancer Institute. Serves as a board member of the Bureau of Tobacco Research, or sorry, the Bureau of Tobacco Control for the New York State Department of Health, and is a member of the Board of Advisors for the American Cancer Society. Dr. McIntosh is going to share with us some tips for successfully quitting and sharing some motivation to join in the Great American Smokeout, which will happen in three days on November 17th. Dr. McIntosh. Uh, the good thing about going last is I can say, as you've heard earlier, blah, 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 and then that can go faster. But the bad news is, well, then what do I talk about? So I'll be sure to throw in some things um, from uh, University of Rochester's research, actually, that that's, uh, I can go over. Okay, this was gone over pretty well by others. So the impact of vaping. Um, you know, it's nicotine addiction. And we talked about uh, withdrawal symptoms, uh, et cetera. So I won't go over that. This slide was also shown earlier, but I can throw in one thing. And that is that at the University of Rochester, one of the toxicants that we found in heavy metals was copper. And I think we were the first to publish on that and other heavy metals that are in um, vapes are nickel, tin and lead. Uh, the problem with flavorings is that it's unregulated, they're unregulated, uh, containing toxicants and many unknown ingredients. So until it's regulated, that's a big problem. So that's actually why we got funded for this. The, if you can see my mouse moving, the Western New York Center for Research on Flavored Tobacco or Croft. And there it's with Roswell Park Cancer Center, as well as us at University of Rochester Medical Center. And we're studying the toxicants that are in the products, as well as vaping behavior, um, health issues, you know, the harms of vaping on health, and also messaging. And that's one of the studies I'm involved in is how do vape users perceive um, vaping? And here's where I will go rogue and show a different slide. Um, this is a poster we presented last month. Um, Hot off the press, we did focus groups and key informant interviews with uh, vape users. And they talked to us for you know an hour to hour and a half, and we had 52 total people. And we categorized all their responses and came up with 10 major themes. So they talked about the device type, the juice source, legislation, flavor use, and you can see some of the quotes, health perceptions, product perceptions. Here's what's exciting me, and it's my mission on, on the slideshow for you all tonight, is to talk about cessation. And so here's some recent young people uh, talking about they would like to stop vaping, but, uh, oh, there's so many stresses in my life right now, so it's very difficult. Well, that's the same thing we've heard from cigarette smokers for decades and decades. Um, if I knew what it's doing to me, maybe I, I if I found it out, then maybe I'll change. Um but I don't know, and ignorance is bliss. Isn't that a wonderful quote? I think I only had quit vaping for like a few months and then I got back into it because I never stopped wanting the nicotine. So that's a very accurate quote. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on because I wanted to just show that about the cessation. Um, we've talked about the drop vape um, as uh, the text messaging and all that and the, that's what the, Nick, the New York State quit line, you can either call 866-NY-QUITS or uh, come to this website, and I put it in the chat earlier, but this, the chatting or the uh, text messaging is the same as the truth campaign and the drop vape. And we think it's the only evidence-based cessation strategy specifically for vaping that's, that's shown to be successful. I agree with what uh, someone said earlier, wrapping it around support is very important also. So the more support you can give um, the person trying to quit, the better. Okay, and then here's a popular slide. Um, every six months or so, we update this, this research and it's observational research, but we go to all the websites 
in North America that are part of the North American Quit Line Consortium. And we simply fill out a checklist. Is there a dedicated page on vaping? Is there something that talks about the harms of vaping? Does, does it say that flavors are harmful? Does it provide cessation resources? Now this got checked, yes, if, you know, obviously it's a cessation webpage. This may not mean it was specifically for vaping cessation. So it's maybe a little misleading. Um, here's a big one. Does it tell you to talk to your healthcare provider? Now, when we first did this poster two years ago, I think it was, only New York State had that check marked, the New York State Smokers Quit Line. Since then, it's it's gone up, but it's still not all the websites. So perhaps all the websites websites should get that um, message to talk to to they should talk to their doctor. News and information specifically about about vaping and vaping as it relates to COVID-19. Um, when we're working with doctor's offices and they're like, oh, we're too busy, we're dealing with COVID, we, we can't spare the time to work on, on smoking cessation. But if they did work on smoking cessation and vaping cessation, they'd have fewer patients. They'd also have fewer patients that have COVID-19 because people who vape and smoke are twice as likely to get COVID-19. So it's all about messaging. Um, but the good news is these things are going up for these websites, uh, resources for people, et cetera. Okay. Was that all of my side show there? I think so. Um, we didn't talk much tonight about second and third hand smoke and second and third hand vape fluid. So if you're exhaling from a vape, it's heavier than cigarette smoke, but it, it is like a mist full of all kinds of toxicants and it lands on the countertop. And so even if you're going outside to vape, it lands on your clothes, you bring it back into the house and the baby touches her hand to your clothes and gets toxicants on her skin. So there, it's a real thing. And our message always is there's no risk-free level of exposure to tobacco smoke and vapor. And as others have said tonight, there's no safe tobacco product. Okay, so we've Heard a little bit about the quit line and the text messaging uh, that you can get at the quit line. Um, we like to talk a lot about how smoking is addiction. Vaping is also an addiction. Um, here's another resource in both English and Spanish. Um, it's a cessation center now run out of Wilmot uh, Cancer Institute at UR Medicine. And if you wanna write down this number and this website, uh, they take everybody, but they also have research studies, including vaping cessation studies with uh, adolescents and young adults and African-American and Hispanic youth specifically, but they will treat anybody, but um, they do have research studies for those vulnerable populations. Um, the Great American Smokeout, GASO. This is our Christmas this week. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it like that. But this is a like, like a big deal for us. Uh, it's on Thursday. And I'm a member of the Board of Advisors for American Cancer Society. So they let me peddle uh, information as much as I want and, and say that it's related to Great American Smokeout. And our state contract, uh, the, the people who run our state contracts encourage us to talk a lot about uh, Great American Smokeout. It started in the 70s as just quit for one day. And research does show if you can just quit, at least quitting cigarettes for one day, you're going to double your chances of quitting for good. Uh, you learn about your triggers, you learn about what level of nicotine Jones you have, your nicotine withdrawal. But vaping also has nicotine and vaping withdrawal. So people who quit vaping for just one day can learn about their own behavior and how much they're jonesing for that nicotine. Like that girl you saw in the video, digging a vape out of a toilet. I mean, this is an addiction. This is not rebellious behavior as others have said. Uh, so I went fast. The, the um, organizers already promised me coffee for staying here late. So I also want brownie points for going fast. Wow, I think you did a fantastic job and you went so quickly and, and you've informed us so well that I do not see any questions for you in the chat. 
Oh, I lied. I shouldn't have spoken so soon. So there is a question that says, um, are there lung cancer screening guidelines for folks who vape or have a history of vaping? Um, I could let the ALA folks answer that, but can I answer that other one that just got posted there first? The can Which young is, can young, can young people get nicotine replacement therapy? Because that's a really good question. And uh, yes, they can if it's prescribed by a physician, if they're under the age of 18. A physician can prescribe it off-label for them. And I believe their Medicaid or uh, other insurance would cover it. I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, but if they're 18 or over, they can get two weeks of free patches from the New York State quit line. And the quit line sometimes has specials on nicotine lozenge and nicotine gum. Two years ago, they had a huge surplus of gum that was going to expire they got it from Pfizer, I think, or from somebody. It was going to expire like three months hence. So a bunch of us contracted from the state. We're like, hey, let's try to pedal this and get it out there as best we can. So that was a, a nice thing that the quit line had of available extra nicotine. Um, uh, the same thing for Chantix and Zyban or Bupropion. They can be prescribed off-label for people under 18 but they really need to be followed by a physician if that's gonna happen because uh, someone's weight is a, is a concern. So if you've got someone under the age of eight, uh, under the weight of 85 pounds, maybe they shouldn't get Zyban or Chantix. And there's a, a contraindication for people prone to seizures, et cetera. But talk to your doctor, that's the best answer, you know, to try to get some of the, one of these products to help you. Uh, I had another point about, oh, so when they raised the age of smoking to 21, um, a bunch of pharmacies thought, oh, we can't sell nicotine patches then to someone who's 19 or 20. And that's not at all the case. The, the, the law, of course, was for tobacco products, not nicotine replacement. So we tried to get the message out statewide that pharmacies still need to sell nicotine replacement to anyone 18 and over. They might be coming off of cigarettes or vaping. It's ridiculous not to sell them that. Okay, can I turn over that other question to the my ALA folks? Lung cancer screening guiding, guideline vape users. Um, I will have to check. Um, just unfortunately with how big American Lung Association is and how focused we are on like our initiatives, I'm not quite sure, but I'm pretty sure there, there must be. Um, I'm sorry for my vague and non-informative response. <laughs> Which is exactly what I would have done. So I threw you under the bus instead. <laughs> There's um, just so much going on in the American Lung Association. Like I said, we've really focused on like our initiatives. Um, but yes, I'm more than happy to get back to everyone on that. Yeah, if you get that, uh, if that can be sent to all the all of us here, that would be wonderful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we've wrapped up the remaining questions that we have. I want to thank our, our panel uh, members for their tremendous information. I think between the information provided and the passion of groups who care for individuals that stayed on this Zoom for two hours gives me great hope. So uh, I, I appreciate everyone's time. I'd like to give just one more opportunity if anybody has any remaining questions or if any of our panelists have a final statement that they might like to make before we close. Um, and I also want to just add that, as we stated earlier, this uh, will be recorded and we will be able to um, post this information on our Wayne County Community School website. Uh, for anybody who is looking for that, um, that's where you can find it. So just any closing remarks for anybody, if, if, if anybody has one. Carrie posted uh, USPSTF recommendations for lung screening. Okay. Uh, for let's see, I'm just trying to scroll through here and find that a low dose computed tomography in adults age 50 to 80 who have a 20 pack year smoking history and current smoke currently smoke or have quit within the past 15 years. Screening should be discontinued once a person has not smoked for 15 years or develops a health problem that sustainably limits life expectancy or the ability to willingly have curative lung surgery. 
Um, and I see that there's a, um, Lindsay's also posted a link here for some um, screening resources from the American Lung Association. Thank you for that. Okay. If there's nothing else, I, I thank you again for your time. I hope you all be well and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Happy Great American.